Also, it'll give me a chance to do some demographic checks. Uh, if your main job every day is to work in firmware, or your main hobby that you love to do is work in firmware, could you raise your hand? All right, so that's the only person. Those are the people that are going to be throwing tomatoes at me. All right, good to know. Uh, but that's, that's perfect. So this crowd is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, I'm going to, the talk today is called UEFI Boot for Mere Mortals. Uh, the idea here is really to give a high level view of UEFI and a little bit of an introduction to firmware and then get into the details of like, all right, so if I want to take the next step, how do I do that? How do I start playing around with this stuff? And what's out there? What are my options? Um, so it is being recorded, so I'll try to limit my four-letter words, though uh, we'll see how well that goes. And uh, I'm also going to give you a brief overview of me. Um, so my name is Stefano. I am a program, open source program manager at Intel. Uh, what that means is that I herd cats for a living. Um, I try to herd them in the direction of open source. And if you know anything about Intel, there's about 100,000 people or so working there. And so don't everybody envy my job all at once, but my job is to try and get them to think more open source in what they do, specifically in firmware. Um, so I'm also the community manager for Tiano Core. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that is, and you can come get some stickers when this talk is over. Um, but uh, I'm the community manager for Tiano Core. I'm also the community manager for Chipsec, which I didn't put on here. Chipsec will not show up in this talk. However, if you'd like to learn more about silicon level security, how to check if your chip is configured properly, uh, come chat with me afterwards. Uh, firmware life. Uh, before I did firmware, I was an embedded engineer. I worked on the Yocto project. For those of you who don't know what Yocto is, it's a framework that allows you to build uh, an embedded operating system. And so I worked on that for quite a while. And then just in general, I'm an open source firmware and hardware advocate. Uh, so I do, basically my goal is I'm trying to get open source, not just close to the hardware, but down into the hardware. And someday, maybe in my dreams, actually on the silicon is the goal. Don't tell my boss I said that. Um, so uh, I did the demographic check. There's not a lot of people here who work on firmware full time. What the heck is UEFI? Um, how many people here are like me and think that UEFI is this thing that when you boot your computer, the first thing you're going to see is probably UEFI and a modern PC. That's what I used to think 10 months ago before I started this. Okay. So I started doing firmware about 10 months ago, and that was my thought. I was like, all right, UEFI is that thing that happens when I push boot on my computer. It's the screen that I see. That must be UEFI. Turns out UEFI is actually just a specification. It's a rather long set of PDFs <laughs> if you are... Uh, in need of a sleep aid, I highly recommend you go download and read. <laughs> um, but the key is that it's a specification that defines an interface. It defines an interface between an operating system, any operating system, and platform firmware. So think of platform firmware as platform firmware is the firmware that runs all of the hardware in your machine. Right? So there's going to be a whole bunch of firmware in there. Not just the stuff for the silicon, for the chip, but the stuff for the RAID card, the stuff for the video card. There's a whole lot of firmware hiding on that, whether it be your PC or your server or your phone. There's a lot of firmware hiding on there. UEFI defines an interface between the operating system world that most of us understand and the firmware world, which, if we're lucky, some of us understand a small part of. Um, so if you see, we've got our lovely display that Harry, my coworker, brought for me. Uh, there is a, this specification is defined by a forum. So there is actually a group of companies that are working together to try and standardize this stuff. And we'll talk about the goal and what the point is, why you would need to standardize all this if it's not clear, a little bit later on. Okay, so what, what is defined in these specifications, plural? Because there are actually several specifications. Um, first off, platform initialization. So when you put power onto your computer, whether it be a laptop or a desktop or a server, uh, the server, uh, the silicon, the chip is going to come out of reset and then something needs to happen. Your operating system does not handle that task. That's the task of firmware. And so one of the things UEFI defines is a standard way to come out of reset and basically do several tasks that you need to do to get that operating system able to run on your hardware. And we'll talk about what those steps are. So it, it defines that initialization phase. It also defines boot and runtime service or interfaces. So, and we'll talk about this again more later on, but when the operating system looks back into firmware, it needs to see a certain set of things, a set of interfaces, if it's going to 
know that it's running on a UEFI compliant machine. Um, I said I wasn't going to say any four letter words, but ACPI, uh, I am going to do one. Um, so how many people here have programmed in an, AC, in an ACPI scripting language? Anyone? No. Does anyone have to bug it? Okay, so if you do it. Turn it off. Yeah, exactly. So ACPI is its own talk. It has a whole big history behind it, and I'm not going to get into that. But that is one of the things that's defined by this specification. Last one is the UEFI shell. UEFI shell, I think, does not get enough play. It's actually kind of a cool feature of UEFI. Uh, so the specification defines this shell that can be written that gives a lot of functionality right at boot. So many of you may not know this, but when you boot your computer, if you drop into the UEFI shell, you have access to Python. So that is really handy, and don't think that the hackers don't know that and are having fun with it. So, but something that you can learn in an easy playground to start learning about what firmware is and what, what, how hardware interacts with software. Okay, so I've told you about the specification. Hopefully now you have some idea that there are people out there writing the specification, deciding how we interface with our operating system. But when you push power, what are you booting? And the answer is kind of complicated, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so it depends what you're booting. And it depends who made it. So you'll hear a lot of people say stuff like, we really need open source firmware. We really need to get more open source stuff into the uh, low level operation of our computers. But who made that computer you're booting? So let's say you're booting a ThinkPad like me from Lenovo. So how did Lenovo get that BIOS or that f piece of firmware on there, right? What did they use to build it? Did they do it themselves in-house? Did they contract it out? Do they see part of that as their value add? So is Lenovo thinking, well, my UEFI implementation is special, so I want to keep it proprietary? Or am I running something from System76? So I can go contact them and ask them, hey, how did you guys build your firmware? What's running on my machine? So there's a lot of possibilities when you push that power button into who's coming into play. And you'll see some really old school players here, like American Megatrends and Phoenix. Those are the guys who have been around since the BIOS days. So when you used to see BIOS flash up on your screen when you first booted, those guys have been playing in that game for a long time. So try to keep in mind, too, when people say, like, we need more open source firmware, and I'm one of these people, there's a lot of guys who have been doing this for a long time, and that's their business model. So it's how they get their paychecks. So UEFI to them is really important because it allows them to standardize what they do for a living, which, as we all know, standardized interfaces makes our lives easier. Weird side note, I am waiting with bated breath for my next System76 machine, so I don't have to use this Windows PC when I go to talks like this. <laughs> OK, so Tiano Core. I talked about the stickers. What the heck is it? And why is it so confusing that there's UEFI and Tiano Core? And what am I booting? So Tiano Core is the community that exists around an open source implementation of UEFI. So UEFI is the standard. Someone has to implement that set of interfaces. So we have an open source implementation that Intel wrote quite a ways back, and then open source. They did what so many large companies do and sort of chucked the code over the fence. But one of the nice things that they've done recently is hired people like me to be the community manager for that and drive that community effort forward. So I mention that because I realize as you go and explore this community, you'll find that it's a little bit bumpy. There are some rough edges. Please bear with us. We're taking a whole bunch of closed source code and moving it into the open. And that's a really difficult task. But we're doing our best to do it in an open source way. So we have groups.io for mailing lists. Uh, we also do calendaring stuff there. We've got Bugzilla for bug tracking. And the stuff, the actual software, the <coughs> stuff that we're doing uh, in the open is EDK2. EDK2 is both a build system to build firmware and a set of code. So it's kind of doing both things. It's, it's building the code, and it actually contains open source code. Uh, we're starting to split stuff out into different repos. So you've got a repo for our platforms, for different chunks of hardware that we're trying to uh, boot well and do in the open. And eventually, hopefully, next year this time, if I'm lucky, I'll be talking about our open source CI effort. So Tiano Core is the whole group of things that works together to spit out an open source chunk of firmware. Now, I say that and I realize that there are little pieces of that that may be proprietary. So for example, today the memory reference code from Intel is not open source. So I cannot say that it builds a completely open source chunk of firmware, but that is the end goal. And I can tell you that I am working at Intel today to get as much of that code open sourced as possible. But as you would imagine, at a large company like that, the wheels, they turn slow. Um, what, is, what is CI? 
Oh, sorry, CI is continuous integration. So, and I was actually just gonna talk about that. So, um, my end goal for this project, uh, what I'm trying to help the community accomplish, is an end-to-end -end solution for open source firmware. The point is, I want people to be able to look at a bug in our bug tracker, uh, send a patch into our mailing list, review the patch in some system, whether that be the mailing list or gear it or however we want to do patch review, then um, see that patch posted to the uh, repo in GitHub, and finally watch it go through some continuous integration system. Watch it be built, watch it be emulated, and in my dreams someday actually be booted on a piece of hardware. And so that's the end goal because then as a community member or as someone interested in contributing, you can go find a bug that you think you can handle or want to try handling and walk through that whole system. And then rather having to guess whether or not the stuff you wrote made any sense, you'll see it plop out the other side in, in the continuous integration environment, see it build, see it fail or pass, and it'll be a more friendly way to do work. Today, a lot of the stuff that's done is done behind closed doors. So that the list of companies that I showed you before, a lot of them are using this reference code. When Intel published this, companies like AMI and HP and uh, Dell took that reference code and said, okay, well my value add is this firmware. So I'm gonna take their reference, which is BSD licensed, I'm gonna go add all of my value, wrap it in a proprietary license and ship it. And that's why chances are you're booting proprietary firmware. It doesn't mean you have to, it means by default you are. And we'll talk a little bit more about things that you can do to go bug those companies and say, hey, here are things I don't wanna see on my laptop. Please don't put boot guard on there. I would really like to be able to run whatever firmware I want. So open sourcing this stuff is really important. And the first step to open sourcing it is understanding what you're booting and why, and then taking steps to change that. For me, the first step is to get people at Intel to follow the open source lead that I've been shown. But for you guys, is to go out and talk to Dell, and if you're booting in, what is it, X, the, the 13 inch laptop from Dell that everybody loves. Uh, actually, actually, yes, 13, yes. 13. if you're booting that guy, when you boot, you're booting whatever Dell wanted to put on that that they saw as their value add, the way that they saw they'd make the most money. It doesn't mean you can't put whatever you want on there. Whether or not you can do that is up to Dell. And so that, that's the person that you need to go talk to because this will help you build your own firmware. Whether or not you can get it on the machine, that's up to the vendor of the machine. All right, so the Tionicor community, I've talked a little bit about this. Some of the changes I've made in the past 10 months uh, Basic open source practices. We have a monthly community meeting. If you would like to come ask questions, once a month we meet, we meet in two different time zones. So you can, it doesn't matter if you're in Asia or in Europe or in the US, there's two times a month that you can join. And uh, community meetings, generally at least one of the stewards of the projects will be on there. By stewards, I just mean someone who's been doing this forever and really understands the system. So if you wanna come ask questions or hear about the latest news, we're having meetings once a month. Once a month. And we're actually starting bi-monthly design and bug triage meetings. And I want to talk really briefly about why this is important for open source firmware. So all this stuff, by the way, is available on groups.io. If you go to our edk2.groups.io site, and there are links in all these wonderful slides that I'll upload somewhere after this talk. Um, I assume I'll stop changing the slides after the talk, before it's questionable. Um, so the reason why these are really important is because in order to change the way firmware works, we need to start designing firmware in the open. And today, like I said, most of this stuff is done behind closed doors. People go off and do their firmware development, and then they, if you're lucky, they toss it out into the open and say, hey, we're all done. So I'm trying to change that model. I'm trying to set up design meetings where people like AMI, and people like Phoenix, and people like Dell, and people like System76, which I'm gunning really hard for, can come to these meetings and talk about the design changes they want to make before they even write their first line of code, and then give them repositories to commit that code to if they want to. So these design meetings are a chance for a company to say, all right, here's how I want to change the network stack in, in, uh, in the implementation that I'm doing. Give me some advice on how to do that. TCP is hard. Here's the way I'm thinking of changing it. Is, does this make sense? Um, so there's a link there to the community meetings. Like I said, groups.io for calendaring, file storage, that sort of thing. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the CI and what my whole point is there. The whole point of CI really is just to make it easier to contribute. Because if you can't see it pass or fail in some test system, how do you know that the stuff you wrote is any good? And it's really hard for a maintainer to then come back to you and say, here's what I need you to fix, if they can't hand you a log that makes any sense, that you can go back and trace why that failure happened. Okay, so I'm throwing a lot of terms at you, and I'm sorry about that. Firmware is a confusing world. 
So we have UEFI, the specification. We have Tiano Core, the community that's producing an implementation of that spec. And EDK2 is our build system. So the EFI development kit. Uh, it's called EFI because it's been around even before UEFI, back when it was EFI. Um, and this is, like I said, a build system and a code base. So I mentioned before a network stack. TCP IP is kind of hard to implement. At least I wouldn't want to do it from scratch. So we have an open source implementation code base available. Uh, how many people here have heard of Pixie Boot or, ah, nice. How many people here work at a company or have seen someone recently doing Pixie Boot? Oh, good God. All right, no, it's good, we're working on it. We're gonna change it. Pixie Boot, for those of you who don't know, is a way to boot your computer off the network. Sounds like fun. Uh, the way that Pixie Boot does this is by using UDP and TFTP. Oh boy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> UDP is basically like me standing in a room and yelling out what I'm doing. Like, hey, here are my bits. Do something with these bits. There's ones and zeros. Uh, TFTP is a way to send and receive that data completely unsecure so that anybody can listen, hear me screaming it, and then grab whatever information I just screamed out of the room. Not really a secure thing to do. Really simple example of how that can go awry. If, I, if the bits I'm screaming out on UDP happen to be the Linux kernel, let's say version 3.14, yada, yada, yada. I sit in your network and sniff those bits, and I see that that's the kernel that you're booting off of in your company. I then go look for unpatched CVEs of that kernel and then start exploiting them on your network. So we have fixed this. <laughs> There's a better option. HTTPS boot is a way to do the same thing to boot your computer over the network, but to do so using HTTPS, using certificates, in a secure way, assuming you set it up correctly. Big caveat there. Um, so it's a build system and a code base. It has the code base for things like HTTPS boot. Um, it's also, an interesting example of multiple corporations working together. Uh, this is something that I try to harp on because when people look at, uh, at the EDK2, they go, wow, this is really complicated and hard. Why can't I just CD into the folder and write make? Well, it would be nice. We're working on that. <laughs> we got Python, and we're going to try to make a build system that's simpler with Python. But think about it this way. The people that are using this implementation code, they're not just booting Linux. They're booting whatever operating system they want. So it needs to be able to build on any operating system they want. So the BSD people have to be able to build with it. The Linux people need to build with it. The Windows folks need to build with it. The Mac people need to build with it. So this needs to support Xcode and Visual Studio and GCC and LLVM and there's a lot going on. It's, this build system is really impressive in that you can build on any OS and you can build the same firmware. I'm gonna say binary reproducible firmware <laughs> on any of these systems and that's impressive. And don't quote me on the binary reproducible part but it is really impressive that it even gets close to that and be able to support all of those, all those uh, communities. So you have a lot of corporations all working together. And to me, that's kind of impressive. It's impressive to see people playing in the same playground. Um, I put a bullet point for growing, commu growing community involvement because that's my job. And so I like to say that our community involvement is growing. Um, and fully validated stable releases. So a little bit about what that means. By fully validated, I mean that Intel produces silicon and needs to validate that silicon in terms of firmware. Tiano Core is what we use to validate it, this setup. So we use EDK2, we use all of the pieces of Tiano Core, the bug tracking. Someday we're going to use the open source CI that I'm going to make. Um, we use all that to make sure that the silicon we wrote has firmware that our customers can look at and go, yep, this works. So when HTTPS boot fails on someone's platform, we can show them the implementation and go, this is our test that shows it worked. Where is your stuff different than this? So fully validated means stable releases. Okay, the EDK2 platforms repo. Uh, this is a relatively new idea where we're trying to simplify our code base for EDK2. As you would imagine, that build system I just described that works on Windows, Mac, and Linux is a little complicated. So we're trying to simplify it down. We're trying to pull a lot of old code out that has no place there. We're trying to get the platforms that are supported pulled out so that if you wanna have your platform boot on it, whatever that thing may be, be it ARM, PowerPC, MIPS, maybe Intel, whatever you're booting off that thing, uh, you can put it in this repository and that keeps the kind of separation of concerns. The hardware will all live in its own place. Um, the main uh, repo branch, master branch, is currently all the stuff that we support in the community. I'll admit it's not huge right now, but we're working on it. Uh, and then we do have some stable branches that track the stable EDK2 branches and development branches for those platforms that almost work or that you may not want to go into production with tomorrow. Um, 
So this is a really uh, exciting place where we're starting to play around with hardware so that you can say, all right, great, you're doing all this crazy open source firmware stuff. What can I boot it on? Because right, if you don't have it on a machine, does it really work? We could emulate it, but emulation will only get you so far. My apologies to the QEMU folks for that comment. Um, EDK2 platforms in progress. So this is some of the ones that are mostly stable and working on being stable. So like Minnowboard Max is completely stable. We're just working on pulling it in to the platforms. For those of you who don't know, Minnowboard was a... Uh, how many people here have heard of Minnowboard or have used one? Oh, not bad. All right. So it's basically an Atom board, maker board, that we came out with a while ago at Intel. And it is fully supported here. It just lives inside the master tree of EDK2. So we're trying to pull it out and put it in platforms. Um, my friends over at... Um, at Lenaro, are working on uh, the Marvel Macchiato bin, getting that thing up and running. Uh, they've already done the BeagleBone, so the BeagleBone Black already works. Oh, yeah. um, it is, it is, however, a little bumpy to get it going because it's not like completely integrated into the system yet. But it does actually work; it's bootable, and that is one of the. I'm hoping we have our hardware that's compatible with Tiano Core. It'll be something like BeagleBone, an Intel board. I even want to see like some RISC-V stuff. Like I'd like to have several architectures so that we can show we are a good open source community. Um, so that's the, some of the stuff that's in progress. There is a group of people that paid me to come here today, so I do have to talk about some of the stuff that I'm working on in terms of their products. Uh, so Intel does have a couple of cool boards. Uh, well, Intel doesn't make these boards. This one's made by Aeon. Uh, but these are some of the boards I'm trying to enable in our ecosystem. Uh, currently, the Aeon UpSquare board is enabled. Um, cool little maker board. It's got a lot of I.O. It's relatively cheap, runs an Atom chip. It's about 150 bucks, so it's, we're not talking Raspberry Pi, but when you look at the I.O. this thing is sporting, it's got a couple of, uh, couple of Ethernet ports. It's got uh, mini PCI. It's got M2. There's just a whole bunch of stuff going on. So much I.O. that they actually have a small Altera, now Intel, um, Max 10 chip on there. Uh, so that little FPGA is actually ferrying all that wonderful I.O. data around. Um, and whether or not you can hack that thing and have it do whatever you want, I don't know. But I encourage you to go buy one and give it a whirl because it sounds like fun. Um, so this is our Atom board that we're trying, I'm trying to get us to fully support. They also are shortly going to be coming out with a core version. So if you don't notice uh, the difference between those two boards, there's a heat sink on this one with a fan. So as you might guess, that's our core offering. <laughs> so... Um, so, the, um, so this board, I'm hoping, uh, what, what I'd really like to see, like I said, is multiple architectures. I'd like to see ARM, RISC-V, MIPS, PowerPC. I'd also like to see Intel uh, contribute stuff to the community more than just Atom. I'd like to see a Xeon board that's relatively affordable someday. And for those of you who are laughing right now, there actually are on Amazon some uh, super micro boards that are around 500 bucks that have a Xeon D soldered onto them. So there are possibilities out there. And the cool part about that and I'll talk about it more in the next slide, but the cool part about that is there's a lot of firmware to play with on Xeon platforms. Um, so this is the core platform. The min platform is a project that we're uh, trying to champion at Intel to try and simplify things for those people who just want to boot and don't want the whole giant load of firmware that we can give you. They just want enough to get them going. Uh, we're trying to do this effort called min platform. Uh, the whole point of min platform is if you do have a server, and I'm assuming most of you aren't going to go drop hundreds of thousands of dollars on servers like this, but when I was talking about that, um, that $500 super micro board, uh, stuff like that might have a BMC controller on it, board management controller. It might have stuff like TPM2 on it. And to be able to play with that kind of firmware as a community, we need hardware that we can actually boot and firmware to boot on it. So min platform is giving us the opportunity to boot the firmware that's open and then Hopefully, with the work I'm doing in the Tiano Core community, we'll actually have a board that's relatively cheap that'll let you play around with server-level firmware. So if you want to learn what that BMC controller is doing, if you want to pop OpenBMC on it and run it and see how it works, you'll have an opportunity. I had to do a little hand wavy there because it's not actually a thing yet. But hence, hence why the picture looks so awesome because it's not actually a thing yet. Okay, so quick recap of what we've done so far. UEFI is a specification. If there's one thing that you take away from this, please, 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 it's that UEFI is just a spec. Somebody's got to implement that spec. When you boot your Dell, when you boot your computer, your System76 computer, they're implementing UEFI in some way. So if you want to play around with that, know who's implementing your, your UEFI specification. And if you can't sleep, go read the specification. Um, Teatro Core is a community. It's, it's a community evolved around implementing 
UEFI in the open, and EDK is the tool it uses to do that along with some of the code. That thing that it, that it builds, the product that gets dropped out, doesn't have a name. And that's why you'll often hear people say, this is booting UEFI. Because even if they built it themselves, there's no name for it. It just got spit out by EDK2. So this is the tree that we're working with today. That being said, what's the point? <laughs> That's the penguin. So the whole point of this is standardization. And like I mentioned earlier, standardized interfaces make all of our lives easier. And there's a lot to standardize in hardware moving to an OS. But if you standardize it, it lets you boot any operating system you want. So I mentioned that I come from the embedded space. 10 months ago when I joined this team and started learning about firmware, my first question was, why is this so complicated? Because in the embedded space, you get your board, probably ARM, it comes out of reset and it drops to an address and you put U-boot there. And then you get U-boot set up to make sure that the RAM is working. You point U-boot at the kernel, you boot and you're done. So why is all of this so complicated? Well, it's complicated because when I, when I was doing all that embedded work, there were a couple of things I wasn't worrying about. For example, I didn't have a TCP IP stack when you bootloaded, because why would I ever need that? If I needed to do something, I used TFTP, because as we used to say <laughs> at my last job, if you plug this board into the network, it's insecure. You've already lost all your security. So standardizing gives us a way to do something after what they call the reset vector. When the, when the processor comes out of reset, we have to do a certain number of things, and we want to make sure that we standardize the way we do that so that everybody doesn't have to reinvent the wheel every time. That's benefit number one. Standardize the way you do initialization. So that means memory initialization. That in itself is not just a talk. That's a course you can go take probably at this university about how to initialize DDR and how you could run you know, your cache as RAM while you're waiting to initialize your DDR. That in itself is a whole subject. In fact, they wrote a nice book on that that I'm blanking on the name of. Um, boot media initialization. In my wonderfully cozy embedded world, boot meant NAND or NOR flash soldered onto the board, or maybe if I was super fancy, an SD card. Turns out, if you're booting a Xeon platform, you might have one or two boot media plugged into that. You might be booting off of a SCSI drive that nobody remembers how it works except a few of us. Uh, you might be booting up with a network. Uh, you might be booting off of RAID. So as you can imagine, that takes a little bit more horsepower than my little embedded board that just needed to pass off to the kernel and lots of other silicon features that you might want to enable. So I have PCIe up there. I can guarantee you none of the stuff I did in my tenure as an embedded engineer had anything to do with PCIe. It didn't get any fancier than I2C. <laughs> um, so that's standardization on the, on the hardware initialization point. The other thing we need to standardize is we need to standardize what the operating system is going to look back and see. Because in the embedded space, when I booted, I was done. The, the bootloader could go away. I'm going to run Linux now, and the few things, the four things that my board does, it's it just going to do those. From a platform where you're looking at Xeons and cores and, you know, lots of big, big platforms, there's a lot of stuff that OS needs to do. And that OS is probably plugged into the network, so it might want to update its firmware when we find out there's a giant hole in the firmware. I don't know, like Spectre or Meltdown or something like that. <laughs> so if you want to do things like firmware updates, Standardizing it means we don't all need to roll firmware update ourselves. We can all just implement the interface and be done. Um, so that's why signed capsule update is right up there at the top. And this is actually implemented in both Linux and Windows. So it's called the Linux Vendor Firmware Service. I encourage you to go look that up. But basically, that's a way that you could, through your wonderful GNOME um, UI, see that there is an update for your laptop. And some of you might have already seen this and clicked on go and it will go ahead and validate that that firmware is actually a thing you should be booting, update it, and then boot you back in your OS. And there's a way to roll back in GNOME. There is not a way to roll back in Windows, but that's a whole other talk. Um, but as you can see, like just we talked a lot about HVS boot. Uh, I'd love to touch briefly on the Python stuff we're doing, but it gives the operating system a way to look back in a firmware, see a standard set of interfaces and go, okay, so if I implement those interfaces, then I know I'm UEFI compliant. Any board booting UEFI can boot my OS. And that's really important for companies that don't just ship Linux, right? For companies, for you, you might just be interested in getting the Linux and being done. But for companies who need multiple OSs, this is the real win. And the win for us, as people who don't want to boot 10 operating systems, is that we get all of the work that they're doing for free. It's just that most of us need to learn how to pare it down, because we probably don't need HTTPS boot. We probably just need the bare minimal to get us booting. And that brings me to my next slide.
what are my other options? Because being a good community manager, I'm not here to tell you that Tiano Core is the answer to all your prayers. Only use Tiano Core's products. Don't go anywhere else. I'm an open source community manager. These are some great products out there that are not UEFI compliant, but are really awesome tools. So like I said, you might just want to get into Linux as fast as you can. And if you do, that's really what Core Boot is all about. So Core Boot, and I have to also bring up Slim Bootloader. A lot of the reason why this stuff exists in this du uh, double form, when you see this sort of thing in firmware, it's usually because Core Boot is GPL, Slim Bootloader, BSD. Really short, making my lawyers cringe version of that. Core Boot is open source, free as in speech. Slim Bootloader is BSD, which means I can take it, wrap my proprietary license around it, put a bunch of magic you can't see in, and ship it. That sounds bad, but don't forget, some people's value add is that. And they really need to get their paycheck so they can you know, feed their kids and send them to college and all that good stuff. So two different platforms. The Core Boot stuff is really awesome. I encourage you to go look at that. If all you're looking to do is get into Linux as fast as possible, that's what Core Boot does. It does just enough initialization of the hardware so that you can toss it off to a kernel. Um, and it really just lets you boot Linux as fast as possible, which is what a lot of people are looking for. Another great project is Linux Boot. This is some really fun stuff. So for those of you who are interested in playing around with, uh, with firmware, but you're Linuxy, you've contributed to the kernel or you hacked around with the kernel and you know that style, you live in that world, this is a great opportunity for you. Um, Linux Boot is essentially saying, how do I take a piece of free software, GPL licensed, sit it on top of some chunk of initialization. Whatever that initialization is, could be core boot, could be Tiano Core's products, after you spit out that firmware. Whatever you're using to do your basic initialization, as soon as you're initialized, drop Linux in as soon as possible. Not as an operating system, but to actually initialize hardware. So Linux can do some of the initialization that EDK2's code spits out. The question is, is that enough for you? So for most people, Linux boot might be plenty. That might be a just enough initialization to get you going. Uh, for the everyday hacker, you didn't know, don't need to worry about, you're not producing a product. You don't need to worry about whether or not the thing you're doing is something you can then sell to 100,000 people. If you're just trying to hack around, this is a way to get Linux in as early as possible. And then when people ask you what firmware is running on your laptop, you can say, well, it's just Linux. I just crammed it into a very small space and got it booting as fast as possible. So I encourage you to take a look at that. So all of these guys, the Core Boot guys, the Linux Boot guys, Slim Boot Loader, and myself as the Tiana Core Community Manager, we all work together. This is an open source firmware community that we're trying to build so that we can all talk about firmware in the open and stop doing it behind closed doors. Um, okay. So if I have implementation examples, I'm going to hold off to the end for questions, but I promise I will leave you at least five minutes. Um, so UEFI implementation examples. I wanted to talk a little bit about something beside Tiano Core, because if I only talk about Tiano Core, it, it gets kind of boring. Um, so there are other implementations. Um, the key is y your implementation that you're looking for of UEFI needs to do full hardware initialization, right? It needs to get you up and running. It needs to provide some boot services and needs to allow firmware to be updated. If that's all you're looking for, that basic set of tools, you can actually use two different UEFI implementations, Tiano Core and UBoot. How many people here know what UBoot is or have used it or burned it on a board or, okay, cool. So you might be a little surprised I'm talking about uh, UBoot and UEFI because UBoot does hardware initialization, but it doesn't do UEFI's spec hardware initialization. It does its own. What happened was this great guy named Alexander Graf, who worked for uh, SUSE at the time, um, he actually did a bunch of work to get enough UEFI working, enough of that, enough of that spec, enough of those uh, interfaces implemented such that when U-Boot was done doing its thing, the operating system could look back and go, oh, I'm on a UEFI compliance system. I'll just, I'll treat it like that. Um, so let's look at some of the difference here and dig into what he did. Um, so Tiana Core, uh, just some basic quick facts. Tiana Core, we've been open source since 2004. Serious community building efforts have happened in the past uh, three or four years, I'd say. Um, but the code has been open source since 2004. Um, we actually initialized the hardware using the spec. Um, and then we run on multiple platforms. Obviously, we run on a whole bunch of Intel Silicon, but there's companies like uh, Linaro uh, who are actually getting stuff running on ARM, and there are folks that I talk to in the AMD world, so it's, it's a larger community than just Intel. And obviously, with Tiana Core, you can build stuff like the UEFI shell. Um, U-Boot, on the other hand, open source since day one. I think U-Boot started like ages ago. I think 99 is actually when it technically started. And, I think most people that I know have been contributing for over a decade. So it's really a very mature open source project. 
Like I said, Alexander did UEFI Lite implementation, which I'll talk about shortly. The great thing about Uboot is it runs on everything. You can boot Uboot on just about any piece of hardware you can find out there, especially if it's embedded. All the embedded boards out there boot Uboot. Um, so you have a large selection of hardware, and you get some of the same benefits with the implementation that Uboot did. So you still get this thing like the UEFI shell. I keep bringing that up because it really is a cool place to play around and learn. When I first started 10 months ago, um, one of the really interesting things to me was, as a Python developer, was when I dropped into the shell and realized that Python gives me access to a lot of the stuff that you would think they would close off for you. So if you, if you happen to use a minnow board, for example, and drop into the UEFI shell on that guy, they have purposely kept that very, very unsafe and unlocked. And the reason is because you can then use Python to poke at the bits and see, hey, is the spy flash part locked? Oh, it's not. Oh, I can put whatever I want on there. And so you can go destroy the flash part with random code. I would highly recommend that you go get a bus pirate first so that you can recover that flash part when you're done. But if you want to learn about how flash works, how the flash ROM piece is booting your hardware, that's a great way to do it. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I keep harping on the UEFI shell. I think it doesn't get enough play. Um, so yeah, U-Boot. What did U-Boot do and what are they? Uh, GPL license, so completely open source, free software, uh, much smaller, uh, hundreds of kilobytes. So really meant for the embedded space, embedded and integrated. And this is the kind of the key that I want to bring up, and this is one of the things that uh, Alexander really likes, is that um, the coding style here is Linux. So if you're used to the Linux kernel, U-Boot will seem very familiar. And like I said, UEFI light, uh, very light implementation, just enough to get the board booting. And so just as a comparison, uh, with Tiana Core, we're BSD plus pad. Again, a whole bunch of companies need that uh, BSD license so that they can wrap up their value add and sell it. Um, we're obviously a little bit bigger. We're trying to boot everything from an Atom all the way up to a Xeon, so our code base is a little bit larger. Um, and then it's a mixed, uh, closed, and open market. Uh, most of the Ubu people that you see contributing are going to be open source people. That, that's a very strongly open source market. Uh, our market in terms of uh, who's contributing is a mix of closed and open. And then, as, uh, as Alexander likes to put it, Linux and camel case style. So you'll find that the style of coding for uh, Tiano Core may not look familiar if you're a Linux uh, person. But uh, at, at the same time, I, so there's two kernel developers who work on, uh, on UEFI stuff on Tiano Core, um, Ard and uh, Leif. Uh, Ard works for ARM now and Leif works for Lenaro. Uh, they're old school kernel contributors. And when I came to them and I said, all right, so as a kernel developer, when you program for EDK2, like what's the barrier to entry? And they're like, eh, it's a completely different coding style. You learn it and you're done. So if you feel comfortable in Linux, you'll feel comfortable in Yubu. If you feel comfortable in Linux, you probably won't feel comfortable contributing right away to UEFI or to uh, EDK2. But like I said, it just takes some time to get started. And once you get started, you kind of get the hang of it. And it's, I like to say, not that bad. Um, so anyway, payload interface, full UEFI, full initialization of hardware for Tiano Core. All right, so why did Alexander do that is the big question. <laughs> why would anyone take U-Boot and do anything but just toss it off to a kernel and boot? Uh, the reason was because it's really interesting. When you implement this interface, and he, like I said, did just enough so that looking back, you can see a UEFI interface. He didn't do a full implementation. That would have been way overkill. But he did enough so that when Grub looks back, Grub sees UEFI. When Linux looks back, Linux sees UEFI. And the key there to, to him implementing that is he took this huge base of machines that run Uboot, and he added this UEFI interface that then lets you go and boot whatever the heck you want. So if you want to boot <laughs> SUSE right, off the, right out of the box, you can boot it. Red Hat, Arch Linux, BSD. Anything you want to boot knows how to look back into that interface. If you want, you could go figure out how to get Windows to work. The process that he used, to, I don't know why you do that, um, but the process he used to do this is straightforward, right? He started writing code, he boots the operating system, it breaks. Why did it break? It called back into some UEFI thing that doesn't exist. Okay, go implement it. Boot it again, it broke. Okay, go implement that thing. So it's a straightforward process. If you have the time and the desire, you can do that with Windows, too. I can guarantee that OpenSUSE will work, though. And that's kind of, whoop, wrong way. There we go. That's kind of the point. He was enabling a whole bunch of new hardware to work by default with vanilla Linux distros. And that's the win that you really get. So for anyone who's ever worked on a lot of these boards up here, if you think it's good to just boot Debian like right out of the gate, you're kidding yourself. But if you implement UEFI like he did, now it can. And there might be some stuff that's not implemented. So start poking at it, and you might find it comes back with, nope, sorry, I can't do that. 
but at least it'll actually run. So that is my talk. These are the two products that I was uh, talking about the most, U-Boot and Tiano Core. So here's the contribution information for U-Boot. My contact information, so if you didn't get a chance to throw tomatoes at me, you can do so online. I accept tomatoes. I am Italian. We love those fruits. And that is all. So thank you all for showing up super early, and I will take questions. Mode, are you bypassing UAPFI and going to uh, BIOS? <laughs> and uh, is that going to continue in the future? Sure. So what happens when you boot to Legacy Mode? Harry? <laughs> uh, <laughs> this so is Harry, my coworker. He's been doing this for much, much longer than me. Uh, yeah. So we have something called the CSM. And so um, those companies that he mentioned earlier, like Inside, Phoenix AMI, they usually will include one of the original um, Legacy BIOSes, or original Phoenix or MRI Inside BIOSes. So when you put a, a system in uh, legacy mode or CSM mode, you might see that in the AMI or Phoenix BIOS, then what you're doing is you're reinstating that uh, original you know, BIOS with the in-calls, uh, F1000 basically, and those services will become available. Uh, so you're not booting, you're not using any of the EFI interfaces in that specification there, and all your traditional IBM PC stuff that's been there since the beginning of time will, will appear, basically. So you can boot a non-UFI OS, the original Windows or Linux, uh, interfaces that use the, the interrupts. Is that going to continue indefinitely into the future? Uh, so uh, Microsoft has made sure that uh, um, all the new PCs coming out as part of their logo specification that um, uh, that you do not ship with uh, the CSM or the legacy BIOS in the system. Uh, that was written in a day and time, right, when there was no security uh, out there and, and there were not as many you know viruses and malware as there is today. So. Uh, they want to make sure that the default setting of, of a BIOS for your commercial systems that you see here, uh, make sure that's, that's turned off. Um, and in some cases in these days, uh, we're working with the Linux sisters and other people as well to, to make sure that also happens uh, with future products. So in addition to just the legacy BIOS not being there, there you mentioned uh, BIOS Group Guard and there's other things like TX <coughs> that would lock all of the firmware in the system so that um, only signed images uh, would ever be allowed to run. So and if you have Chromebooks or you know other types of systems where you would physically have to open up the system and move a jumper or compromise the system somehow uh, to make sure that you can uh, turn off the security mechanisms in your in your hardware. So just like a, a smartphone or a, uh, a Chrome system, right? You, you then have to be able to get physical access and make sure you, you turn off of uh, all the security mechanisms in order to be able to run any non-signed firmware, basically. Key to the answer too there was turning off security. <laughs> like, that's something that's important to remember. Legacy BIOS is great and then it might just work and you might not want to go to FOSTEM and put that laptop on the network. Good luck with that. <laughs> More questions? What sort of support do these various projects have for Risk V? Great question. So we are working on that. Um, so a great person to talk to um, in terms of U-Boot uh, would be Merrick. Merrick is the guy who knows the most about RISC-V and U-Boot. And far as Tianocore goes, I am full steam ahead on that as soon as I get the basics going. So as soon as our CI system is working, I'll start looking at RISC-V. But that's very much in its infancy for Tianocore. I think for U-Boot, it might be functional. You might just check online with that one. But Merrick is your guy to go to for that. Uh, I don't think so. He's based out of Europe. So I don't know if he flies in for this. <laughs> but yeah, he's pretty easy to get online. You'll see him on the mailing list for U-Boot. More questions? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what this darn thing does. <laughs> so am I. And so it sounds to me as if what it does is it loads all of, all of firmware and all the various devices. And then it's done. Yes. Is that it? Essentially. So that's, you bring up a good point. So the question is exactly what is it doing uh, and when is it finished? So. It, it is essentially going to be finished at some point and pass off to the operating system. The important thing to remember, though, is with, with a UEFI implementation, depending on how you implement it, it can leave a window open. And that way, the operating system can ping back to the firmware. And that's important for things like updating the firmware. You really want the low-level code to know what version it's at so that the OS can ask. You don't want to just guess or assume no one's hacked in the wrong numbers there. So yeah, there is a little piece that's left even after your operating system is booted, uh, and that's based on your configuration and what function calls can go back are very much up to how, is it, how it's been implemented.
Okay, but the, the only application for that that you have that you can think of is, is for updates update. one. What's another? Uh, so you can, guess, by, um, you can ask is divided code. up into two different types of interfaces. There's the boot service interfaces, and that's stuff that is used. He had a list of things like MRC uh, initializing the CPU, the GPIO pins, uh, the various whatever whatever your boot devices are in your system, which is your storage device typically, and uh, your video and, and input output console, so that you can run the BIOS setup screens if you're if you're not inside the the operating system. So. Uh, there's there's a, a set of tables that are created by UFI. Um, there's these boot services to help initialize the system to boot to your hard drive, NVMe, whatever your boot device is. Uh, and then there's uh, some runtime services. As you mentioned before, the runtime services is what's left. There's a phase of UFI called exit boot services. So after we've given control to Grub2 or boot motor in Windows or whatever, when we're done, after the operating system has retrieved all of the uh, necessary kernel and uh, boot files it needs off of the storage device, then you hand up control, then, then the, the job of the OS loaders to then pick, get rid of the boot services, and then the only thing left are the EFI runtime services. Is there something beside uh, uh, Capsule Update that's a good so, example? So uh, for EFI runtime services uh, defined in the spec, you're required to have uh, a reset mechanism so I can reset the system. Uh, there's uh, Sorry, the reset, is, reset is to reboot it all over again. To reboot the system and start over again, right. The operating system, when you see start, shut down, or whatever, right, you have, have to have a way of reliably resetting the system. Um, there's real-time clock stuff, too. And there, yeah, there's uh, uh, time services, so all operating systems need uh, a clock source to, for the file system and the operating system to run off of. So uh, the runtime, or RTC clock, or the clock services are important. Uh, and then the other thing is NVRM services. So for this, the boot options of where the, to describe to the operating system or the bootloader where the um, operating system is located at and what kind of storage device uh, that the operating system is uh, located on, those are, are required to be there. So typically there's only three or four services that stick around <coughs> after exit services after the loader is done that uh, is still around for the, um, uh, for the OS to use. Uh, and separate to, from UFI, there's the ACPI specification. So there's usually also ASL or AML code. Uh, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. That's a whole other that, bucket of worms. <laughs> that, that, but that's typically what the operating system really uses to talk to your system. So back from the old days, the, the operating system guys did not trust the BIOS, right, mm -hmm. because it's closed source and they never had any control over it. So they always used the ACPI methods, either looking at the table or using the uh, ASL or AML code to be able to talk directly to the hardware in the system. And we're actually out of time, but I'll be here all day. Harry will be here all day, so please come pick us. Thank you very much. Thank you.